Uh, from the White House perspective, what to you was the key thing that we just heard from uh, Donald Trump there? Uh, well, I mean, I, I am quite interested in the president's relationship with Speaker Ryan. Obviously, you know, he was very complimentary, said Paul worked very hard. You know, he wasn't willing to throw him under the bus yet. Um, but there's a lot of people inside this White House and among Trump's close advisors who have never liked Paul Ryan and who see this as a moment to, you know, try and push Paul Ryan uh, out of the sphere of influence as well as President Trump's chief of staff, Ryan Priebus, who is a very close ally of Ryan. I'm very interested in how the dynamics there are going to shape up because that's going to determine how well he can get the rest of his legislative agenda through Congress. Does he have a House Speaker who we can really come together and work with? Or is there going to be an increasingly tense relationship there between some in the Trump White House and the President and the Speaker? And Sahil, uh, of course, uh, Speaker Ryan had mentioned that we're going to move on with the rest of the agenda. He said we're going to secure the border, improve the military, close the deficit. He listed three things before he got to tax reform. Meantime, you just heard from the president that he said he's now going to go for tax reform, which he's always liked. Isn't there a disconnect there? I'm not sure there is, Scarlett. We know that tax reform is a project that is very close to Speaker Ryan's heart. He talks about it all the time. Um, and, and if the president has decided that this is what they're going to do next, then I think that's how it's going to be. I don't think there are going to be any protests there from Speaker Ryan or other House Republicans on that. I think what is true is that they have some other agenda items that are in their way. Um, they have to fund the government at the end of next month. They have to raise the debt limit. They have to fund the military and find a way to pass a budget through Congress, which frankly is going to be tougher than passing this health care bill in a way because they can't, uh, they can't bypass the 60-vote threshold there. So they do need Democratic help to do that. One thing I thought, Scarlett, that was very... Uh, remarkable in what President Trump said is that he he said he wants to work with Democrats now to fix the health care system. The only way that's going to happen, as uh, from, from all my reporting on this topic, um, is if they drop the repeal promise. Uh, if, if President Trump decides that he's not going to try to undo this law, that he's going to try to fix parts of the market that don't work, and there certainly are. There are uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of counties that don't have only one insurer. Some insurers are fleeing the markets. Prices are going up in so certain areas, like rural areas. Democrats want to fix all these things, but not if it means undoing the benefits in the law. So if that, if that happens to be the course that President Trump takes, I think it's going to, you know, I, I think we're going to see a level of bipartisanship on health care that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. But it remains to be seen whether Republicans can get there because again this is a promise they've spent seven years making and the idea of, of, of jepping it to uh, you know of, of uh, backing off that and moving to something else is not going to be easy to do uh, let's bring it back to markets here with uh, David Balin of City's private bank you heard Trump talk about how okay well we're gonna move on to tax cuts now is that gonna be easy I mean tax cut sounds good but it's gonna be more than that it's tax reform you have parts of uh, the Republican Party that wanted to be revenue neutral border adjustment issues is it going to be smooth sailing in your view? Not at all. And I think that the, the Freedom Caucus, the, the fact that they were so tight, what was interesting about what Trump said actually was the degree to which they were unable to come you know, to terms. There were 10 or 15 was the number that he used, which implies that the Freedom Caucus was really quite together. The Freedom Caucus is going to want a deficit neutral or even a deficit reducing uh, uh, tax reform plan. And it clearly was not part of the, of the concept of tax reform that they did, uh, that they were considering. They were going to bring money back you know, through tax repatriation and then spend it. Uh, and they were going to spend it in specific areas of tax reduction and corporate and individual uh, you know, tax reform. So I think that this is an indication that I think the struggle is going to be, uh, be more significant than people would expect. So looking ahead, how, do, how does this change what you do in your day job when, when you're managing money and when you're looking at how to allocate uh, your investments? How does this change it? So it actually changes it um, in significant ways. It makes us take a look at a variety of things that are kind of subtle but important. So, for example, you know, we would expect this to take a longer period of time, which is going to mean that we think mar market volatility may return over the course of the next three to six months, creating different entry points. It's going to change. It's going to change a mix in terms of what we're looking to. I think we're going to see more investments move into emerging markets and into the European markets, and we're going to see the dollar actually do less well. We've, some, we've seen the beginning of that in the last couple of weeks. So it does change our asset allocation. What it doesn't change is our fundamental view that having equity exposure and having a more pro-growth portfolio is really going to work over the next 18 to 24 months. We haven't lost our essential enthusiasm, but I think we have a real, you know, this is a moment to actually really consider how to build the right portfolio.